Hello, everyone. Um, this session will be about geological and paleontological principles. Of course, it is mirrored on the normal PowerPoint presentation that I have right above this, which has built in sound files. For those of you that find it easier to follow my conversation by being able to rewind and, and stuff, which you can actually do, you know, with that sort of format, you're welcome to follow me on this presentation versus the other one or both if you choose. Okay, so let's go ahead and do a slide share of the PowerPoint and let's get into this. Geological and paleontological principles. So we're talking about geological principles. These are just the principles that we use to um, sort of understand the past, the past history of Earth and the processes that have happened to it. And paleontological is just when we're trying to understand the processes that happened in life in Earth in the past. So geological and paleontological principles are highly intertwined together because where we find life, extinct forms of life, is in the earth and we need to have ways of determining the age of these things you know the processes that have occurred so that we can actually sort of rebuild our past lost world so these are the basic principles that will that'll tell us how to do that or will give us skills in this okay the first thing we have to do is be able to frame some time these are some important benchmarks that we have to get under our underneath our belts and so you should hold i'll hold yourself i'll hold you to this on exams believe me so some of these things are very important let's think about the age of reality itself and that's the universe that it helps us you know, acquire a sense of deep time when we start putting things you know in, in what called perspective a relative perspective to our lives to the actual you know origin of reality which occurs 13.8 billion years ago on average so there's some there's some argument between 13.77 and 13.83 so i grabbed the sort of middle territory i think middle territory i think that's a pretty good approximation the earth itself a little bit better idea of when it first formed initially so it was recognizable as earth as a solid planet about 4.543 billion years ago how about let's just round that down to 4.5 would be just fine yeah now, the thing is, is that within this whole field of billions of years in the history of Earth, you know, nothing that even resembles like a monkey, even in primate, that more like a tree, like a tree shrew that was up in a tree, you know, with just small primate characteristics, which we'll talk about later in the course, you know, that doesn't even occur until 65 million years ago, which is really relatively recent. And the actual evolutionary history of the Earth and compare that to the evolutionary history of the universe and humans ourselves, um, in the modern form we are now, you know, physically and psychologically uh, modern, uh, last 100,000 years, which is just a fraction of the time of the universe, one 138 millionth of the time of the universe. So we're just a blip in the eye, you know. So how did this blip in the eye uh, not only get here, that's the subject, but, you know, how do we evaluate what's happened along the way and give evidence? So how do we know what we know? Well, geology helps us uh, immensely in discovering the past, okay? Uh, one of the things we use to sort of record time and to give us sort of a, you know, a, a, a sheet where we can always refer to when things are happening and why they're happening, we uh, widely use what's known as the geological time scale, abbreviated the GTS. Now, this geological time scale, which I'm gonna to present to you, and first of all, the reason I put in bullet points here, I said it's divided into eras, periods, and epochs. That's very important for you to know. I'm not going to hold you to what's in the geological time scale because it, it's, it's sort of a woolly thing to sort of memorize, and I don't want you to do that, but I want you to understand how it is organized. So let's look at that now in relation to errors, periods, and epochs. Here we go. All right, so that's the GTS. And this is the history, not of the universe, but the history of the Earth. So it's geological, the geo is with Earth. Um, our history begins down there at the bottom of 4.5 billion years ago and, you know, takes us all the way to contemporary times at the very top. Now, how this thing is organized is over on the left-hand side, we have a longer period of time, recorded periods of time. And that longer periods of time can be truncated and segmented down to smaller period of time if we move to the right. Thus, the longest period of time that we have are, are eons. Then the next short period of time where the eons are truncated down are errors. Then we could truncate the errors down into periods, and then we can truncate the periods down into epochs, the smallest frame of geological time. What is the purpose of this? Well, things have to happen. Things do happen. And at the eon level, describe major big things, the overwhelmingly large things that have happened on Earth. And within those overwhelmingly large things, what are the next bigger things that happen? That's the errors. 
Then within the errors, what are the next bigger things? The next smaller things, but major things that happen. Those are the periods. And then periods can be developed, divided into epochs where things also happen, but at a smaller scale and in the time frames. So when we're looking at all the labeling out here, it means there are distinct changes in Earth or in life on Earth that are happening, you know, within those within those elements of time. We'll be looking at the most important ones. I'll define what are the most important ones, the things that are very specific to us. And then we'll look at some of the general stuff too, which is also important for us to get to know. Oh, but next, let's look at some other things that this might, the clues this might have for us to try to understand how the thing is put together. Well, when we look over on the left-hand side, the far left, we see the eons. And the thing that I notice most if when you actually look at the name, so we, a name has, you know, it's, it's more than just a word. I mean, if there's particular meanings with, lies within words. So it says Phanerozoic is the eon which we live in, right? Phanero, okay, that's sort of life, animated. Uh, zoic life, so animated life. We actually have, you know, animated. We have animals. This is the rise of the animals, the Phanerozoic. So basically, 542 million years ago, man, this is the the giant spread of animated life. Boom, life on Earth really begins to going. Now, the eon before it, pre-Cambrian, so pre-animated, pre-complex life. So during that period, you know, we had a life, but it's not complex. It's pre-Cambrian, pre the explosion of complex forms. Right? Great. Now. The thing is, is the eons are very long in time. I mean, we have a, a half a billion, over a half a billion years of this explosion of, of complex life. We had to figure out, you know, how that life is changing if we want to try to understand the arrival of ourselves. So we need to break it down into smaller components. Thus, the errors arrive. So the, the errors that are associated with the, you know, the, the Phanerozoic uh, eon are the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic. So let's talk about what these mean. And it's very simple, Paleo. And zoic, old life, old complex life. Mesozoic, mesos middle, zoic life, so sort of middle complex life. And then seno means new, and zoic means life. So we have, you know, middle or sort of, no, sorry, more contemporary or new life, new, right, new complex life. All right, so now we have this phanerozoic, which means complex life, the earlier forms, the older forms, the middle forms, and then the recent forms, right, the newer forms. Right? You see the logic, how it's put together. Now we can go into the um, uh, the epochs, and those describe specific things that are going to be happening within the fields of like old life, within the fields of middle life, within the fields of sort of the, the 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 late life. Now that kind of resolution for an introductory course is too much, and it becomes very overwhelming. So we're really not going to be looking at the epochs, and well, it's with some exceptions. When we get to the Cenozoic, when we see the rise of primates and humans. The epochs, which I have listed there, the Paleocene, Eocene, Oligocene, Miocene, Pliocene, Pleistocene, Holocene are important because specific things happen and they coincide with specific things that happen within our evolution. And they're, and they're very descriptive things and they're useful for us. But for the rest of the, for the GTS, all the stuff down below in the epoch level is something we're just gonna absolutely and completely ignore. Well, what else is sort of interesting about this? Well, the names in which I just told you about, think about them. This is a geologic, which means Earth time scale. But think about what the names are saying. Zoic, life. Well, how, how is it has to do with rocks if everything has sort of a word life associated with it? Well, interesting thing about the, geo, about the Earth in itself and, and life on it is it's co-evolved together. As the Earth has changed in its geological history, so has life. But as life has also changed, it has greatly influenced the Earth too. Not only in its weather, but in the constituency of its rocks, they become far more complex. And that complexity of rocks, because of the death of life being inculcated with, into it in the rock cycle, has led to the evolution of even more complex life, which had a feedback to be more complex soils and more complex compounds back in the earth again. So there's a sort of a co-evolution that's happening here, so inextricably linked together that you can't divorce life from the geological timescape. So I want you to understand the overall sort of um, organization. And, you know, in the lectures, when I speak of things like we're, like I talk about things which are happening to mammals in the Mesozoic, you'll have this time scale with you. I hope you want to keep a little copy of it somewhere. You can understand exactly where, where I'm at, what I'm talking about. So you can get a relative field of time, you know, a feeling of what, how long these periods of time are, these times are. So you can start thinking in deep time, which is something Darwin had to sort of uh, accomplish too in his life. 
Now, there are other ways of sort of presenting the geological time scale. There are many different versions of it. They all say pretty much the same thing. But I like this one because it really does show how life and the earth are inextricably linked together. So we can look, um, let's look at something like the Paleozoic. Why not? Let's go down to 545 million years ago to 245. Let's look at that 300 million, 300 million years of time. So, you know, when we look at what's happening, life is changing. Look at the bottom, explosion of organ with shells. We have fish, an extinction event, no land plants, another extinction event, trees, reptiles, and another extinction event. And meanwhile, the Earth, we can see some of the bigger things that are happening on Earth at this time. But what we want to try to think about is this, is that if these things called eras are big things and big things happen in, the, in, in them, what causes something like the Mesozoic to begin? What causes something like the Paleozoic to end? Okay. What, what's the big deal? What's happening? Well, when we look at life at 245 million years ago, it says extinction event. 99% of all of life was eliminated on Earth at that point. We call that the end Permian extinction, the mother of all mass extinctions. And it changed everything. It changed life. 99% of all life was eliminated. It changed events that were happening on Earth. It was a catastrophic change on Earth. In fact, it was a noticeably different change when that life was eliminated. Because extinction, as bad as they are, it gives new opportunities for the survivors. And sort of new forms of life are going to effloresce, which we see within the Mesozoic, with the rise of dinosaurs, mammals, and birds and flowering plants, right? And we enter a whole different sort of form of life. So we have to try to understand too, as, as this course sort of unfolds, you know, what are these boundaries about? And how do actually they influence life on them? Because without these events happening exactly in the way in which they have occurred on Earth, no you and no me. And that's an absolute reality. Everything that we're talking about has to happen in that exact same sequence. Or if this, this thing which we call human would not be here right now and will probably likely not ever show up. Okay, next thing to sort of look at on this chart are uh, other sort of boundaries I want to sort of hone you into. Let's move towards modern times to sort of show you how this sort of works. Again, I want to give you another example. So we looked at the Paleozoic, Mesozoic boundary. How about, let's move up, let's move to the Mesozoic, Cenozoic boundary. Remember the middle life as it moves into a sort of new life, you know, on Earth? What's that all about? What happened? Well, you see in life, it says right there, dinosaur extinction, extinction event. Yeah, about 70% of life, boom, immediately eliminated on Earth. It takes with it, you know, all of the large scale dinosaurs and most of the reptiles, of course, leaving new opportunities for for a, another form that had recently evolved mammals, all the mammals on Earth right now, would, would have very little chance against the dinosaurs. But that extinction event you know, left new opportunities for those survivors. And we end with the expansion of mammals you know, in the Cenozoic, as it says right there in July category. So we need to really understand how extinctions work, the tragedy of them, but also the hope you know, in which they provide the creation in which they also survive you know, um, after they threw in for those survivors. And we'll be looking at, at how that's actually occurred too, and how we can actually track those extinction events, you know, in geological science. Okay? So there's our handy and useful little geological time scale. You know, I have two different versions to look at, and uh, a gaze at, depends on which one's more helpful for you. Okay. Next, to really start to try to understand, you know, how the Earth is put together and how we study it and life upon it, one of the most important terms that we have to sort of put under our belt, and this is like our definitional space we need to know, is the word context. You know, it's a, it's a word that floats around quite a bit in our society, but we have to think about really what it means. Okay, so I've wrote a brief definition down here. The circumstances that form the setting for an event, and in terms of which can be fully understood and assessed. Let's break that thing down because it's like a, like a, like a Merriam-Webster sort of definition. All right, so if I find a fossil, you know, an imprint from an animal that lived 100 million years ago, if I find it, right, I just pick it up off the ground and I take it home, and all I have is a fossil, all right? All I can see is I got the fossil of the form. I just know that form exists. I have no idea why that form exists. I have no idea what it's evolved to do. Now, if I go back to the field where I found that fossil, and I look at all the fossils around it, and if I can rebuild the environment in which it lived in, right? Know its predator-prey relationships, right? What it had to cope with, 
on a daily basis, what it had to survive against, I will know why it's shaped and why its form is the way that it is. Because I will see those interrelationships. I will build original context. And really in paleontology, that's our goal to build the original context in which an organism was in so we can understand why it is the way that it is. We expect to find fossils. They're always going to be there. They're remnants of ancient life. You know, we pick them up. All right, great, cool. We've got a new form. But how that form got to be there is what we're interested in. Not that the form did exist. We assume it's there. Okay. All right. Now, when I say that we're paleontological, it's also closely allied with what we do. An anthropological or paleoanthropological investigation of the past is just a paleontological investigation, but specific for one line of life, and that's human life. Right? We're looking for the rift in evolutionary history of human life. And that would be the, the main difference between those terms. But essentially, if people ask me, what do I do? I say, I'm a paleontologist, but I live for humans. Right? Paleoanthropologist. All right, next, taphonomy. All right, so how does ancient life present itself? Well, you know what? You're capturing something when it died. That's it. So if I get a fossil, which is you know, a mineralized version of, of life itself, and we'll describe those, I'll describe those processes, or imprint or something, I'm getting a print or a version of when that thing died at the moment of death. And so we need to understand something about the taphonomy, the process of death, and what's happened to it since it died to be able to build, rebuild the original context of how that thing was actually living. What was the predator-prey relationships? How was it dealing with the environment? You know, what things were co-evolving around it? So once that thing died, it's pristine, you know, it captured its moments of life and then time goes by and then bad things can go by. The earth can move, we have processes of sediment, rivers, snow, glaciers, everything are moving things around, tearing them away from original context. We get abrasion, we get wear, we get chemical alteration from even rain and things hitting it. And also the other life around it. You know, we have a dead organism that's fossilizing, you know, life moves things around. Think about you digging in your backyard or excavating stuff. We're constantly moving soils around, mixing stuff up, taking things out of the original complex, uh, uh, context. And not just humans, think about what even trees do with their roots. Think about all the, the ground dwelling, uh, you know, organisms such as moles and farm, all these little bowls and what do they call the weasels, you know, and all of these sorts of things, gophers that are down there. And they're taking our, our fossils and the relationships and moving them out of original context. Well, taphonomy is a branch of science designed specifically to rebuild the context with specific rules on how we can get evidence on where things should be, taking them and restoring them back to that time of death so that we can try to pull some information about that organism's life. And it's a really important thing that we do, but we have to remember that taphonomy always tries to lead us back to establishing original context. That's why it is the king and what we're trying to do it is the number one goal. Now, uh, for, the, uh, the, for us to do all this stuff, for us to understand original context, we need to understand something about how you know, the earth is shaping itself, you know, how it moves. How can we actually rebuild the earth back to where it was, let alone put the organism back there and then reestablish the, the, the ecological environmental circumstances in which organisms live. Well, we had to start with some of the basics, some of the structural concerns of Earth, and we need some principles to be able to do it. Essentially, there are five principles you need to do, need to know to do about 85% of everything in geology. And it's very true. If you really want to understand geology, understand five principles, and bam, you'd be surprised what you can actually do. Well, here's some of the history of it and the principles themselves. Okay. The first three basic guiding principles of geology were set forth by this guy, Nikolai Stenow. So, you know, Steno lived very early on, you know, back in his life, 1638 to 86. Poor guy, you know, he didn't live very long, but you know, that was the way it was back in those times. But he was extremely brilliant uh, as an early geologist who knew nothing about the earth whatsoever. And he was just watching soils, watching horizons, and, and, and seeing what, how the earth was sort of put together. And he came up with this. Now, the first one was, seemed sort of simple. It's called the uh, principle of superposition. Superposition, what was that? Pretty simple. If you walk up to rock layers, and you can see you see road cuts all the time, or layers of rock or soil. Where's the oldest? Where's the oldest level of soil? Well, at the bottom. The oldest at the bottom, and new rock layers are added on top. And it's a simple, simple, you know, principle. And kind of, it's kind of for me, it's kind of a dull. Probably for you too, well, dull, right? Well, that's you know, 
in hindsight, you know, because the modernness of our life, we're able to see other models around us that allow us to see that as being a truism. But back then, they, they had no idea. And Nicholas and I was the first to actually sort of demonstrate that. Now, the next is called the principle of original horizontality. All right, so if you see rock layers, you know, and they're tilted up like this, you can see the rock strata, they're tilted up. They were originally flat. You know, rock layers are generally laid down, generally laid down with respect to the gravitational field, right, which is flat all around you, so everything is flat. And then something happens to the earth, some movement happens and the rock layers get tilted up. So if we see tilted rock layers, we can figure out how much time it takes to, 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 to move things up, up. And we can actually sort of restore them back to their original context where they should be at the time at which we find our fossil so that we reconstruct the environment. It's very helpful to have guiding principles like this to allow us to know that we can you know, lawfully, you know, under the laws of physics, you know, actually do things like this. Now, the next one is a, kind of another duh thing. It's called the principle of lateral continuity. All right, so we've made lateral continuity. Here's the thing, if, if, if you see, uh, you know, a river, you know, going making a river valley, it, it cuts through rock, right? That's how the river cuts through rock, you know, with all the sediment moving through. You can look at the canyon on both sides of the river, right? Well, on one side of the river here, like on the left side of the river, you're gonna see a rock layer and you're gonna see the same rock layer on the other side because they used to be connected together. There was continuity, right? These things actually connected, but the river moved through and tore the rock layers out. But well, what you can do is rebuild the original context and say, what well, one time, because we know this, the river wasn't there and those rock layers extended together. So the environment was different. It didn't have a river in the past. And maybe at the time, which our fossil was there, maybe it lived in a different environment that didn't have so much water, but the terrain was different. So that principle also helps us rebuild original context. So that's just three. And that's the one, the principal ones, which Nicolas Steno provided. And there are two more, which are really important. Now, you know, as far as the, you know, if for those of you who didn't really sort of understood what I said at the beginning, the beginning about the principles, here's some pictures, very simple, you know, so we can see, you know, a real picture of rock layers down the picture below this in the Grand Canyon. Um, and the very oldest layers, these schist layers are down. I've been in the Grand Canyon, it's really awesome. I worked for the National Park for a while. And I've been down there rafting and getting down to the really the oldest stuff. And of course, the new rock layers pile on top and you get up to the youngest sequences. And that's exposed because the river has cut through there to allow us to see that. But the continuity would be, if you see any one of those rock layers extends, should extend all the way across the canyon and have you know, a partner on the other side. The rock layer will meet on the other side. And you'll see the exact same rock. It should extend across. And that would be, of course, you know, lateral continuity. Now, additionally, you can see superposition here too in a little cartoon drawing where you see the, the Oper, the, the oldest stuff on top and superposition at the bottom. Super just means the chief ordinate that was the beginning position. Okay. So um, the tilted layers, here we see layers of earth which have been tilted. And uh, Nicolas Deneau's a law of original horizontality tells us that instead of those rock layers being curved like that, at one time they were flat. If we can figure out how long it's take for them to curve up, what was the rate of curving and movement, Let's just say that it's take 200 million years for like a rock layer, one rock layer to tilt up like this. And we think our fossil is 100 million years old. So guess what? We just got to move it like that about halfway so that we can get an idea of what that environment looked like. You know? and then we can look for other clues so that we can start rebuilding the original context, which is why it's so important that we have these basic principles that we know as laws, that we know this is exactly what has happened in the past. All right. Of course, there's lateral continuity again. You can see where the river's gone through and the rock layers should be connecting together, same layers on both sides. I think that's a fairly easy principle to understand. So let's, let's go on to the other two principles that, that put this thing together so we can do 85% of everything geologists do. Well, James Hutton. Now, James Hutton, I, I, I've mentioned him before when we were talking a lot about the rise of the theory of natural selection. Uh, James Hutton wrote a very important book in 1789 called Theory of Earth. And in it, you know, he postulated the age of the Earth being millions of years old. He's the first guy to actually do it with quantitative evidence. He was looking at the, the downcutting of glaciers through, through valleys in Scotland um, and uh, utilizing some quantitative measurements about the amount of soil that was been taken out by ice versus how much time it would take to eliminate the entirety of these, these ice sheets, you know, cutting through all the debris. 
and put, you know, eight to 11 million year figures just on cutting out these glacial values, these valleys, and he knew the earth was immensely old. And this really put geology on the map as the actual quantitative science. But what else did this, uh, this founder of modern geology, by the way, James Hutton is given that, that, that term. Now, here's the problem with this term. Okay? There are many other terms. There's founders of ge British geology, founders of American geology, right? Um, so which, wh which one of the founders is he? Well, he's the founder of modern geology, okay? So in other words, when we're utilizing the scientific method, everything goes back to sort of this back right here. There have been a lot of other important people that we I've talked about. One is Charles Lyell. And of course, Charles Darwin brought that, that his famous work, you know, the principle of geology on board with him. But Charles Lyell would have never been able to write his book without this guy right here. And this principle called the principle of cross-cutting relationships. Then he added to uh, Nikolai Steno's original three observations. Now, um, with this one, it'd be hard for me to describe, you know, uh, just speaking to you. So I would say a picture is worth a thousand words. So help me tease this one out for the next one. So we, here we have a block of land, a cutaway of land, right? Like you just brought a block up out of the earth, showing all the rock layers that go down at the tops of the surface and the stuff that's by superposition, the oldest stuff, of course, on the bottom. Well, by cross-cutting relationships, what does he mean by that? Well, let's have a look. So let's look at some of the features that are within this block of earth. Let's look at some of the igneous stuff. That's molten rock. So see the things that say dikes. There's dike A and dike B. In, in geological terms, dikes are igneous intrusions where hot lava is under pressure and gets squeezed up to the earth, where it's the weakest dead and protrudes up and keeps continuing up towards the surface. Okay? So dike A goes all the way up to the surface. Now, what about dike B? Dike B gets to a rock layer and there's some weakness in the rock layer. So it spreads out within the weakness of the rock layer instead of going straight up. And so there's Dike B. Cross-cutting relationships. Which one occurred first? How do we know? Which one do you guys think occurred first? Look at it. Did the igneous intrusion A happen first or the igneous intrusion B happen first? All right. If you're, if you're, you know, befuddled with this, it's pretty simple. Um, which cross cuts which? A cross cuts B, it goes through B. Therefore, B must have been there before A. So that we know something about the sequence. B happened and then A happened. But we can extend this to all sorts of other things in geology by using this simple, you know, cross cutting relationship sort of postulate which is actually very simple. So I, I would say, arguably say this, being a geologist at the time, you know, of, of um, our great uh, James Hutton here would not have been all that difficult. Okay. So what is the next principle, the number five one? Number five, we've already done four, right? So we've done superposition, original horizontality, right? Lateral continuity and cross-cutting relationships. What's number five? Number five is principles of faunal succession. This is the one that brings life into the mix. And this is really an important one too for us. And it was, you know, uh, thought through and put forth by this man right here, Will, William Smith. Not me, Will Smith, because this guy can't get jiggy with it. He's not like the Will Smith we know, right? And in fact, this is the anti-Will Smith. Look how unhappy he is. He's like, this is my birthday. This is my birthday smile. <sighs> it's like a caveman. Well, it every right to be sort of that way. Um, he spent some time in prison in London. It really wasn't a very good time he spent. Oh, don't, don't ask, don't tell things up there, I'm sure, right? But, you know, he never looked happy for the rest of his life. Um, but he was extraordinarily famous. You know, for a convict, he did some really famous work. I shouldn't bag on him that much. He, he, he didn't intend to be coming, going into prison. What he did was, is he, and he had a French assistant, uh, a geologist assistant. They were going all over Britain, finding out where the geological resources were. I mean, vast things for coal to make steel, all sorts of mineral resources. They found out where all these things were. He was a great geologist and he was planning on making map books to sell to the new industrialists and miners. He was gonna make a fortune selling to, to the location of all these things. So he borrowed a ton of money to, make his, to buy his own printing presses. He wanted to do it all himself. And just about the time the book was gonna go into print, his French assistant ran away with all the secrets, took him to France and started making map books of his own. So, and they did, and he floated the market. The French guy made a ton of money, but this guy left with nothing except owing a ton of money, all right, for those printing presses in which he bought. So they put him in debtor's prison. In fact, then he went to prison if you were sort of in debt. Um, but even though he was a convict, he got out and he went on to do some wonderful things. Um, 
so wonderful. People overlooked his time in the debtor's prison and he got a term. Now, he's the father of British geology, okay? So Hutton is the father of modern geology and he's the father of British geology. He did so such important work. And one of the things he did was final succession. Let's have a look at this, how it works. And this fits in with the idea of natural selection and evolution on Earth. Very good principles, right? So here you're seeing rock layers, right? So by superposition, we know the oldest ones on the bottom, that's the Lower Cambrian. We talked about the Lower Cambrian. That sort of begins, you know, somewhere around 540 million years ago. And it goes up to about the Mississippian, which is, you know, maybe 260 million years ago. So, uh, you know, we're looking like 80 million years of time across this from the top to the bottom, right? And we have the little geological, um, you know, um, epochs that are happening in Lower Cambrian, Middle Cambrian, Upper Ordovician, Salernian, Mississippi, and then we're going up through time. And within these rock layers, there are different versions of an organism called a trilobite. Now, the versions are the names which you see those Latin terms, but those are for the genus, right? The overall genus of like a, you know, like we have a genus, you know, Homo and our species of sapiens, like anything that's sort of related to, to, to us or anything that's sort of related to a trilobite and gets its own sort of genus. There's a, the average genus uh, sort of designation, okay? So at the very bottom, we have Pedemius. That's the first sort of genus that happens. And the next time we go to, when we go up in layer, if we go to the middle Cambrian, you know, Tetropia, Chechopteria, we have that, okay? Elanerus, um, we have Elanerus. Eruntius, that sits in the Ordovician. Phacops, which sits in the Silurian, uh, Devonian sort of period, and Philipsia, which sits in the Mississippian sort of Permian sort of region of time. Okay. Well, what Will Smith said is this. That, okay, in the fossil record, Pedumius lives in the Lower Cambrian, and that's the only time you're ever going to see him, because when Pedumius goes extinct or changes into another form like the Tacteria, it can never come back. Once a species is gone, it's gone, gone, gone. It's either gone extinct or transformed into another species. Same thing with everything. Like if you look at the Silurian, if you see phacops, when phacops live during the Silurian, it's the only time it ever lived if it went extinct. If that's the only time you ever see it, then it might, you know, morph and evolve into a philipsia. And William Smith said this, okay, suppose that you went down and found uh, a Padomius that lived in the lower Cambrian. And you're out doing the old geological work in a rock layer, and you found that fossil in the Mississippian Permian layer near Philipsia. Philipsia. What would you think? What would happen? You found something that lives in the lower Cambrian, and all of a sudden it's in the Mississippi rocks up here, or was that that level? William Smith said, Don't worry about it. It got moved. Okay, it's not supposed to be there. You can lawfully put it back down to the Cambrian. Because when extinct, there's no way it's coming back. So some act, some vol, you know, some earthquake, some man-made thing, something in the past has actually moved that rock layer, shifted it up, so we can lawfully take it back down. Now the thing about it is when Will Smith said this, he said this before Darwin was even talking about fossils. He knew something about species, like they change, they evolve, they shift, they differentiate, and when they're gone, they're gone. And he placed this basic geological principle that contained aspects of life in it, you know, and it's geology books, which is why geology and the knowledge of this was so important for Darwin's thinking, because he was seeing evidence like this in a written and in, in valid principles. All Darwin had to do is figure out how things changed, not that they changed. He wasn't the first person to understand that species had changed, right? But he was the one that figured out how they changed their natural selection, right? Now we have our five basic principles. So what about you know the fossils themselves? Well, what are they? Well, there's two basic types of things we're gonna get. Okay. We're gonna get things which are petrified, which really means this. If you take you know, the remnants of a dead organism, what do you have left? You know, the skin, flesh is all gone. They're getting it with teeth and bone. These are the durable things. If they're buried gently, okay, with not a lot of energy in the system to tear things apart very rapidly. They don't de decompose anymore. And if you get a right amount of mineralized groundwater, you know, they drink mineral water and the right mineral balance of groundwater flows in, comes in contact with the bones and the teeth very gently. What will happen is, is the minerals in the water will take the place of the minerals in the bone of the teeth. And we, we've demonstrated this in our laboratory situations. This happens, you know, this ion transfer begins to happen long and slow over hundreds of thousands of years. 
to where the mineralized water, water would take place, you know, take the place of the bone. And you end up with a carbon copy of rock, right? It's literally a carbon copy. And that is the, the process of petrification. And now here's the thing, it takes low energy systems, which means normally when we think about energy, let's think what I'm, I'm talking about here, right? So, um, you know, you guys go to the mountains, you see waterfalls and stuff. Now well, suppose that an organism fell off a waterfall. You see how fast the water is moving down the side of the mountain? What are the chances that the bone in our teeth are gonna survive being ground up by large boulders, tumbling everywhere? Everything's gonna get demolished. The energy is too high. They're gonna get no trace of, of an organism left. It's gonna be petrified. But what about the ocean? Someone's swimming along the ocean out there. I'll say, oh, oh, they drown. They sink to the bottom of the sand. Everything's tranquil and nice. They're gonna be, you know, the waves of sand are gonna come in, you know, for a little bit of the surf and cover them easily. Not a lot of motion, keep getting buried with sand and the sediments piling over them, right? Now they're gonna be held gently down there without being tearing apart. And the water is going to be moving into the pores and spaces between the sands and getting into the bones and teeth themselves and petrifying them. Thus, you know, when we find fossils, they're always from low energy environments, normally from oceans and lakes or around rivers, you know, like the Sacramento River flowing down the delta nice and slow. If you die in there, you're going to be covered with silt nice and gently. So the fossil record, which we really have a snapshot of, for, for the most part, are from organisms that live in low energy environments. You know, it's not like we're getting all life on Earth, but since there has been so much life on Earth, we're getting a pretty good healthy proportion of it. And next, trace fossils. Right, so this is when we don't have the thing in itself, the bone or the teeth that permineralize and we get a carbon copy. This is when we get like, you know, a, a remnant of it, like a trace, like an imprint, an imprint. Or we can get something like the, the biological excrement. And those are called coprolites, which are great. So when we see fossilized poop, it's excellent. That's, that's a trace fossil. It's a trace of what the original organism was, the debris which they leave behind. So we can get tracks, you know, imprints from leaves. Uh, we can get fossilized poop. And this provides an actual wealth of information. For example, let's think about coprolites and what they can write, fossilized poop, really? Yes, absolutely. So what do you guys think that you can find in someone's fossilized feces? I think you're thinking maybe about what it ate. And that's very true. You get the diet of what something ate, which is important. Tell something about its life, life way. But you can get more than that. You can start rebuilding the entire, re the, the original context of the environment in which the animal lived in. You don't realize that when you guys are like out, where most animals you know, live outdoors and pollen's running all over the place, raining down everywhere on your food too. And pollen grains are really indestructible. They fossilize very easily and they don't get broken down in the digestive system. So where your food's out there, it's getting all the pollen from all the plants landing on it. And then, you eat that or the other an another animal eats that, it gets pooped out and fossilized. And then we find it, we can take thin sections of the, of the rock and find these microscopic you know, pollen grains that are in there. And then we know what kind of species of plants or types of plants are the environment. Now we're building original context. We begin to build the forest, the plants, you know, to figure out what an environment it actually was, let alone you know, the information that the actual diet provides too. So, you know, even things like trace fossils can provide, you know, a huge amount of, of um, you know, a wealth of data for us, right? Um, so we talked about, you know, footprints on, on the soil. Well, how does that relate to us? Look, <laughs> right here, these are called litholi footprints. These footprints are dated to about 3.4 million years ago. And what can they tell us about our ancestors? Well, they tell us one thing, our ancestors were walking upright. They had a nice, you know, arch, arch foot like we did. And they're possessing some degree of reasoning and intelligibility. And that's what I mean. Those footprints were made of volcanic ash, real thick volcanic ash. It's like snow. When you walk on snow, you don't want to go into places where you can like, you, don't, you see the snow, but it might be a branch for it and you, you fall in. You don't want to fall into that. So how do you protect your family? Well, what's happening here? You have the big footprints, which is by a male, and the female is walking in his footprints. Why would she walk in his footprints? Because if he's walking on this stuff, she also won't fall through. When you ever see a deer do something like deer, other animals don't have the intelligence to do that. Early hominins were smart. And off to the left-hand side, what do you see over there? Some stray footprints? Yeah, that's junior. That's their juvenile. The juvenile is not gonna walk in the footprints. You know, these little kids are gonna run all over the place, gonna endanger themselves. So what do the parents do? They hold them off to one side. 
to catch him in case he falls through. So male walking forward, female right behind him, and probably the female holding Junior off to the one shoulder like this to keep him in line so he doesn't run away. So now we're talking about getting information on behavior. So that also really does build the behavioral context of the organisms we're talking about too. So we can read a lot from the fossils of the past if we learn how to do it, and that's part of this class. Right? So now determining age. Uh, it's important. You know, we have to know the age of something that we're looking at. We're going to talk about sequence and when things are changing and why things look the way that they do. Um, and determining age, can, you know, can be relatively difficult. Look at that picture right there, Cher. I, I can't, I can't believe I put that. I'm a bad person. But her, I remember her when I was a little kid, and I'm old, right? And uh, I'm like, does she, does she live forever? Or how much cosmetic surgery does that girl had to go into her? Because I don't know. She must be like a hundred. Oh my God! So how old is it? Very old. Well, how is it that we determine the age of fossils and the age of the Earth? Well, there's two sort of broad categories of, of the way that we do this stuff. Um, the first category is what we call relative dating, and the other category is called chronometric dating. Relative dating is this, when you don't have the thing in itself, okay? I don't have a, I, I can't date the fossil. The same how I pull a fossil from the but I can't date it. What I have to do is date things which are close in proximity to it. If I can date the age of a rock I found it in, I can get a relative date on how old the fossil is. So when we talk about dating rock, that's lithostratigraphy right there. Litho means rock. So lithostratigraphy, litho rock. Now, what if my fossil is in volcanic ash, like those footprints right there? If I can get the age of that volcanic ash when it was laid down, I know when, roughly when those footprints are made, don't I? Well, volcanic ash is also known as tephra. So tephra, tephra stratigraphy. Yeah, gives us a good window into when, you know, footprints were being made and fairly accurately too. Well, what if I find a fossil in rock layer, okay? And the fossil is next to another fossil. And I already have a copy. I know what this fossil is. The new one, I don't know. So I can make an approximation of the age on the new fossil if it's found in association of one of known age. So if I know this thing's 185 million years old and it's found right next to another fossil that I don't know how old it is, but by approximation, they're probably both 185. So biostructure in comparison to other known forms of life. This is a very valid approach to being able to get, you know, determinations on how old something is. Now, the thing about it is, is that relative dating techniques um, aren't as accurate as what we call chronometric. When we get to chronometric technique, that's dating the thing in itself. So the fossil itself, there's something that in it that can sit the chemical componentry of it that we can actually date and get an age on the object. Um, and we, this is the golden thing we're trying to show. This, this is the route that we want to go with, right? That's the primary way. But if that doesn't work, we can also fall back to relative sort of dating techniques. Okay. Now I talked about relative dating techniques. There you go. How about let's do something here, all right? So I, I, am, I, uh, I find a new fossil, right? And I name it Parafusilina boise. It's a type of clam. You can see it, it's in the Permian period. Look at the Permian. So you go down the Permian, look on the left-hand side, you see Parafusilina boise. Great. Um, something about the chemical matrix of the fossilization, there's nothing in there that I can date the thing with. I don't know how old it is, but I find it in association with the Totus americanus, they're right next to each other in this Permian period rock. Well, I know how old Leptodius America, americanus is, so Parafusilina is probably the same age, right? That's biostratigraphy. But they're also in Permian period rock. So I know how old that rock is anyway. So by association, Parafusilina boise, the fossil I just found, must be a Permian age, a Permian age. We can't really narrow it down to which part of the Permian age, but sort of part of the Permian age. So you see how it's sort of a good rough estimate when you can't date the thing itself, but I can also use two things to do relative dating. The, the biostratigraphy technique by comparing it to something of known age, the left odious Americas, Americanus, and also the Permian period, the age that we already know rocks. Uh, lithostigraphy, this just shows too, if you find something in, you know, an extenuation from what we saw here with the Permian period, um, that, that all of these things are of known rock layers. All over the world, what geologists are really good at is they go all over the place and they get dates on rock layers. And they're really good at that, really pretty good, accurate dates. 
So let's look at the, the middle Jurassic here. Let's look at the Calovian stage, which is a rock layer. Calovian stage is a bunch of clay, clay formation. And that clay formation happened about 157 million years ago. So if I find a fossil in that Oxford clay formation, I'm going to assume it's around 157 million years old. That's lithosegeography. That, that's exactly how it's done. And we thank geologists for that because they give us you know, books of all these tables with the known ages of those rocks. Okay, so before we go on to um, you know, chronometric techniques, dating things in itself, let's figure out you know, how in general that we really start utilizing fossils. You know, we really are trying to understand you know, process, the original context and why that thing looks the way that it is and how life has changed through time. So how do we do this? What you're looking at here is called a seriation. A seriation. It's a very simple thing. This is how I explain it. Okay. So from, from the top to the bottom, you're going down in time, down in time, these rock layers. Don't let the weird numbers, one, two, three, zero, from the top to the bottom, time. And those little lines this way are just you know, rock formations there. Now the blue lines, the little blue things, are species. Okay, those are the numbers of individuals of that species that we found. So there's 12 different species in this one area, 12 different species, okay? And the thickness of the blue line tells you the number of fossils of those that we find. And it's changed through time. So let's look at number 12, okay? So you know, at the very bottom of the sequence, the very bottom, there's a lot of 12. But as time goes more and more modern, what's happening to the 12? 12 gets narrow and narrow and narrow. It's beginning to go and finally, we see no more 12, it went extinct, bummer. Well, what's happened to 11? What happened to species 11? Well, when 12 begins to start going down, all of a sudden 11 is there going up. So as 12 going towards this demise, number 11 starts to build up. There's competition in the environment. Or the environment is changing in a way. It could be the environment is becoming dry or wetter, and number 12 just can't adapt, and a new species come in number 11, which can adapt to that environment. It's telling us process about what's going on. All of the changes, right? The numbers of individuals through time give us an indication of environmental change or changes in other organisms, which giving a selective uh, advantage. All we have to do is investigate the environment. Was the environment changing? Was that it that was causing the species demise and the rise of another? Or was it the species themselves that were changing? And it's because of that competition that some species were out competing other, comp uh, other species. And that's what we do. We have to create the serration first before we can start probing in and asking deeper questions. So once we find the fossils, not a fossil, but how, the percentage of the fossils within the, in the matrix we're looking at, the rocks we're looking at, we begin to compare them and watch them change through time. So when I find a fossil, I'm also trying to dig, keep digging back through time to look how that thing is changing and the relative abundance, the numbers, and compare it to other fossils which are changing. This makes no sense if the only thing I have is a 12, okay? If the only species I had here is a 12 and I sort of watched it went, go away, I'm like, okay, it went away, why? I really get to understand when I see 11 right next to it, some other clues are happening to get process. It gives me a reason for what is going on. We'll be utilizing some of this stuff when we get to what are human stuff. We can see some human ancestors are changing at different rates. And we can actually make some predictions about who's going to be here right now. Of course, it's us. Uh, we can actually see that through time. We can see some of the, the benefits that we have, uh, which marginalize other species of humans. And we can see that through serration, just like this. All right, now, tephrostigraphy is very important. Uh, remember I talked about lithostigraphy, where you can find something you know, in rock or footsteps in like in tephra. This is volcanic ash. These are just layers of volcanic ash. What's cool about this is that you can really precisely date volcanic ash. Rock layer is not, it's really hard. You know, there you kind of understand within 100 million years, this rock layer, right? There's things plus or minus 100 million years old. That's a huge amount of time discrepancy when we're talking about what we think the age of something is, you know, varying over millions and millions of years. But when you're dating volcanic ash, we're talking about it can be within 10 years difference. I mean, very fine chronologies. When we find footsteps or things, you know, bare between ash layers, um, we can get very refined chronometric measurements because um, 
ash has some particular constituencies to it, which we're going to look at in a few more slides down, that allow it to be really perfect for dating things, you know, like impressions, like humans walking on stuff. And what's so cool about this is that that we're going to learn soon, you know, the, really the origin, the regions of our evolution, our main sequence becoming modern, occurred in East Africa. And it's that East African area that's full of volcanoes, putting out lots of volcanic discharge for the last eight to 10 million years, and providing a perfect place in which we can get samples of the volcanic ash and match it with sequences of human growth and activity. So we've got a pretty fun chronology we're going to be utilizing this for, which is why I'm featuring it here. So you'll have a heads up to pay attention to the volcanic ash, the Tephras to take All right, so, you know, the thing about it is, is that I talked about the seriation that we do. Well, here's the deal is that, you know, um, I said that we usually look for things like, um, you know, bone and teeth, um, you know, in the organisms that are dead. But, you know, we are also trying to establish the context in which an organism lived. And remember where I said that, you know, you could look at a copper light and you could get the, the, the fossilized or the pollen greens within it and sort of rebuild the context of the environment. What if you did that with a lot of poop, right? Or look in the, the rot record and we're mining it for grains of pollen. You could produce a pollen seriation, which shows, right? The amount of pollen that's in the environment is reflected to the number of trees, right? That are producing that pollen. So when a lot of pollen from one tree, there's a lot of those trees. When there's just a little pollen of a tree, that means there's a little bit of those trees. That's a seriation of the pollen of different plants and an area in which we find our fossils. So we can know what the plants are doing, the type of plants. You know, are they thriving or are they going extinct? Are new plants coming in? Are they out-competing them or is the environment changing? And we can place the fossil interest, the animal of interest in that. And we can try to understand why the animal is changing as its environment is changing. Or maybe if the environment changes and finally we see our animal go extinct, we'll know the mechanism behind it. Right? So we're actually putting process you know, in the past. We're bringing it to dynamic life again. The life of us in the past is not static. It's one to, reconcept to reconceptualize and place in motion. And we actually do this graphically too. Not only do we take charts like this, we actually try to produce you know, visual images of what's happening through time. That's why we hire a lot of CGI people, computer programming people to assist with this. Because again, you know, a picture, a moving picture is worth again, a thousand words in your conceptualization. Now let's go on to what we call chronometric techniques. This is where we're dating the thing in itself. You know, we're trying to get a date on the object. And we can get a more refined chronology. It can be much more accurate. Now, here's the thing I want to say. That whether if we're doing relative dating technique, you know, like we were looking at before, or we're trying to date the thing in itself, we're never going to get an absolute date. We know exactly how old it is. All techniques come with a plus and minus figure, okay? So if I find a rock, I say, okay, it's 100 million, 80 million years old, plus or minus 3 million years. So there's like a 6 million year variation. That might be the plus or minus. I'm just throwing that out there, but it will always come with that. Always. We're never going to get an exact date. It would be it would be inappropriate for us to say that. But chronometric techniques come with a much smaller amount of variation than do relative dating techniques. All right. So what do I want you guys to know? All this sort of mess over here. Well, the stuff over here on the left. So you know, everything on here is a valid technique that we we, we use chronometrically. Um, what I want you to know is the stuff over here on the left that has the asterisks on it. And you'll see radiocarbon dating, C14, right? And C14 is it's just another way of saying radiocarbon dating. Uh, we have potassium argon uh, dating and uh, argon argon dating. But because potassium argon dating is exactly the same as argon argon generally, I just want you to know potassium argon or radiocarbon dating. That's it. Those two. It's those two. How they actually work. Here's why. They're the ones we use a lot to investigate the past, and they're cheap. I mean, relatively, they're not as expensive as the stuff over here on the right. All that stuff you got to send to like specialized university or NASA, you know, and you, you're going to spend a lot of money, a lot of your research budget, you know, trying to get a date on something. And those are like, in, if I can't get a date using the cheap stuff, then I'm going to see what kind of money I have in my research budget, and I'll send a sample off, you know, and get some sort of a, a, a time value estimate. So I want you to be aware that there are other techniques, but one of the reasons we utilize the left-hand side is simply because of cost. So let's figure out when we're gonna employ these things, you know, when met one method over the other, what would be their rationale for actually doing it? 
to do this, we have to understand you know, how these dating techniques work and what the substrates are, really how it is. And let's have a look at radiocarbon dating. So uh, don't let the next image mesmerize you. I'm going to take you through a tour of what's happening here. All right. okay. It's all pretty simple. It really is. Um, okay, so um, your atmosphere driving around you, you know, full of things like, uh, you know, oxygen, carbon dioxide, CO2, and also nitrogen is floating around up there. All the time there's nitrogen floating around. And what happens is, is that when we think about the, the carbon, the CO2, well, there's really a couple of different types of carbon. You know, most of it is what we call carbon-12. Most of it's carbon-12, right? But 1% of it, it's a little bit heavier. We call that carbon-13. And then we have a, another type called carbon-14. It's really a very small fraction. Look at the number there, right? Look at the point, it's like 0.0, it's like, uh, oh my God, look at the fractional number, a very small percentage, right? So essentially about one ten millionth of the atmosphere, I believe, is like a, of radioactive carbon up there. As I said, it's radioactive. See, it's C14, which means it's unstable. It's really a heavy isotope. And um, in the atmosphere, it will spontaneously degrade. The carbon will degrade back to a nitrogen someday. So why is this important for us? Well, let's think about it. What happens is, is that you know, we have um, nitrogen floating around the atmosphere, floating around out there. And the sun, you know, has a lot of radiation. Cosmic radiation comes in. A lot of these things are neutrinos, things we can't see, you know, floating around out there, moving through the earth. And occasionally they'll strike a nitrogen in the wrong way. You know, they'll strike it and they'll turn it into carbon-14, radioactive carbon. And this thing will stay radioactive for a while, on average for 5,730 5, years. It'll stay carbon-14 and then it will degenerate back to nitrogen again. Okay, it goes back to nitrogen again. This process is always going on. Every once in a while, again, cosmic radiation will hit a nitrogen, nitrogen 14, turn it into a carbon 14, big old stable, unstable carbon, float around for 5,730 years and spontaneously convert back to nitrogen 14. In a pretty constant rate. So our atmosphere has just about that constant percentage of carbon 14.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.
if there's a little bit of radioactive carbon, we can figure out how long it's taken for that radioactive carbon to decay back into nitrogen 14. And we can get an idea of how old you are by utilizing it's a decay curve. That's it. So your carbon 14, the radioactive stuff is going to decay and convert to nitrogen over time. And we can look at the percentage that we expect to find in your body. And as that drops down, we can tell you how old you are by following that radioactive decay curve. So the trick is, is knowing one term. So like, blank your mind out of everything you learned so far, you know, put it in your notes, refresh yourself, right? The term half-life is associated with this. And here's what I mean. We talk about radioactive decay in terms of half-life, and this is what we mean. So if I have radioactive carbon that will eventually turn back to nitrogen again, if I have one pound of it, one pound of it, in 5,730 years, I'm gonna have a half a pound. That's what we call the half-life. That's the half-life of carbon there. So every 5,730 years, carbon halves itself. So start out with a pound, 5,730 years later, I have a half a pound. Another 5,730 years later, I have a quarter of a pound. Another 5,730 years later, I have an eighth of a pound, right? Another 5,730 years, I have a 16th, a 32nd, all the way into smaller and smaller divisions, right? So this is a curve that predicts the half-life, what the expected values are. And all we need to find out, you know, is how much the percentage is, and we can know how many half-lives have come by, gone, you know, since you've been dead, and we can get an age on your bones. Well, who else has bones in the past? I talked about your bones. It's really mean of me to talk about you being dead 50,000 years in the future, even though you will be, right? But we're looking for things in the past. Now, the thing about this is that what can you date? Well, one is only organic material because only organic material like has carbon in it. That's the problem. So we really are, are not dating things which have petrified, okay? So they have to be organisms which have been rel relatively well preserved without petrification. And we can get a date on it. So really we're talking about relatively recent human activity. You know, and how far back in time? I'll tell you, normally the process of, of pr preservation in the past will go back maybe 50,000 years. That's about it before we can get a reliable date. We have enough carbon left. Okay. So we can talk about you know, things that have happened within the first 50,000 years. Now, another reason we can't go by 50,000 years, too many half-lives go by. We just don't have enough radioactive carbon left uh, to even measure it. Our, our instrumentation is not sensitive enough. So as far back in time, we can go as 50,000 years anyway. So radioactive carbon to use as a dating tool can only take us back 50,000 years. Okay. That's the ugly part about it. When we do have the carbon, it's pretty accurate. It's pretty good. You know, it's pretty darn reliable. So what do we do when we have stuff that's older than 50,000 years old? And believe me, that's most of the time in paleoanthropology, we're looking at stuff you know, millions of years old. What do we employ? That's the second technique I want you guys to look at, okay? Oh, by the way, I should show you something too. It's kind of like interesting that I told you guys about the baseline of radioactive carbon that's always normally in the atmosphere at that percentage right there, 0.01%, right? That's what the atmosphere constantly produces that amount. So we know, the starting value of radioactive carbon in your body, because that's the atmospheric baseline. That's what you're taking in as a percentage of the plants that you're eating. So that we know what the baseline and how it drops you know, over time. But something kind of messed that up recently. Check this out. And it began in about 1955. Also, the radioactive carbon began to spike in the atmosphere and it's totally gonna blow our measurements you know, in the future when we're trying to date things in this age anymore. So what happened? What put all that radioactive carbon in the atmosphere? Hydrogen bomb testing, nuclear bomb testing. One of the products of nuclear bombs is radioactive carbon. Unfortunately, I was born right there in 1961-ish where the radioactive carbon was beginning to spike. And that's my primary growth years. So I took in, like many women at my time, an extraordinary amount of radioactive carbon that's decaying, made radioactive carbon and causing mutations. And if you look at a generation which suffers from more breast cancer and all sorts of cancers like colorectal cancers and other things, it's my generation. And you wanna know why? Right there, thank you, your US government, because they're not gonna tell you that, are they? So if you think about a reason to sort of ban nuclear testing, it's for your own good. It's for your own health. And cancer is a horrible thing to actually die from. And that's one of the leading causes right there. And it also messes up our dating techniques in the future too. Okay, 
Okay, so let's go to the next one. I talked to you guys about potassium argon dating. And so the last one, the last thing I'm going to do today, I promise, is the last thing for the entire unit. You have to wrap your head around before we go into the quiz, all right? But it's important. Potassium argon. So what is this? Okay, well, put it this way. There's a lot of potassium in volcanic ash, right? Which is what we like it. So in that way, we can date volcanic ash this way, right? So there's a lot of potassium in there. And the, the, the symbol for potassium is K, right? So you can see the little thing I have, it thinks it's potassium dash AR. Argon is AR, okay? So you can use a symbol if you want, or you can just say potassium argon. What does this actually mean? So what happens is, is that there's a lot of potassium in rocks everywhere, you know, clays, minerals, you know, it's just, it's a natural con constituents. Now, some of, um, some, some of the, some of the rock that's out there um, is um, particular isotopes of, of potassium, heavier forms, right, and lighter forms. There's little different varieties of it. So a lot of rock out there has a type of potassium called, you know, potassium 40, 40 potassium, a lot of it, okay, right? So um, what happens is that potassium 40 um, will, over time, you know, convert um, uh, 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 to argon. It will spontaneously decay to argon, just like our radioactive carbon fourteen spontaneously de 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 decays to nitrogen. All right. So when does this happen? How do we know? Okay. So in the Earth, where all the rocks that before it's going to come out of a volcano, that forty potassium down there is converting, you know, slowly converting, you know, to argon, to argon gas, and um, and what happens is all together, you know, in hot rock clusters. And we can measure the ratio of 40 potassium to 40 argon. So we can get an idea of how long the argon in the crust of the earth has been decaying. But here's the deal. As soon as a volcano explodes like this, it dries off all the 40 argon. That's the decomposition component, right? It dries it off and the atmosphere is gone. So that only 40 potassium lands back on earth. It's like starting, brand, starting the clock brand new. And as soon as it lands on Earth in little clumps, the little the little tetra clumps, there's little a little little like little you know, pores and spaces in the minerals and stuff, the 40k begins to convert to 40 argon. And all we have to do is measure how much 40 argon is being developed. Then we know how much time has gone by since that ash hit the ground. This is awesome, and we can measure that. We can just take scoops of volcanic ash, put it in the machine. Then we can measure the ratio of 40 potassium to 40 argon. The more 40 argon we have, the longer it's been in the ground. We just got to figure out how long it takes. What's the half-life it takes for 40 potassium to turn into 40 argon? We know the half-life. Get this, it's huge. It's 1.3 billion years. Now remember radioactive carbon, 5,730 years, what the half-life is for everything converts. Now it takes our half that converts, half a pound, half a pound, half a pound. You know, with this half life time it takes to take like, the whole thing and make half of it, and then another half, and another half. Well, this takes 1.3 billion years. To so say you had a pound, say you had a pound of 40 potassium, to have a half a pound. Okay? That's how long it would take. Okay? So we have huge amounts of half lives. So, how far can we go back and use this to date? We can go back almost 4.5 billion years, we can literally go back to the very beginning of the earth. Now, if we can find the tephra and the rocks, this stuff is reliable to date sequences that happen almost since the beginning of earth, okay? The problem is, is the half-life is so long that instruments, by the time we start trying to like measure, has any 40 potassium turned to argon? It takes about 100,000 years to get enough of the material to even tell it's begun to decay. So we can't date anything younger than 100,000 years. So anything between 100,000 years and 4.5 billion years is golden. And we just use a decay curve like we did before, right here. So if we know the fraction of, of uh, 40K remaining in a rock, the fraction that's supposed to be there, and just go down this, this decay curve here, well, we can figure out exactly how old that object is, you know, when was actually created, when the volcanic ash was created, that's in our fossils inside the volcanic ash, right? And that layer, we know when it, the volcanic ash covered our fossil. 
and we can move back in the decay curve all the way back to like 4.5 billion years ago. Now, theoretically, we can go back 9 billion years, but you can't because 9 billion years ago, this solar system wasn't here. That's why we placed the limit at 4.5 billion, right? That's the, the beginning of Earth, okay? So uh, radio potassium is a real uh, benefit for us because again, a lot of the, our human ancestors are found, or at least traces of our found, are found in ash sequences that we can actually date reliably utilizing this radioactive decay technique, potassium argon. All right, so to wrap it up, um, the purpose of this chart is sort of show you that, now we can always get a date on something usually, you know, it depends how much money you want to throw at it. So right there, sort of in the middle on the left-hand side, we see the two prime techniques which we've utilized, uh, radioactive carbon, and then we see potassium argon, right? And those are the date ranges which you can use them. Now here's the thing, you know, radioactive carbon goes up to about 50,000 years, but when you get older than that, you can't utilize it. And for potassium argon, it has to be over 100,000 years. Okay, what happens if we have an object that's 75,000 years? What do we do? That's when you throw money at it. You can use uranium series dating. You see uranium series dating. You see the solid green line. We can get solid dates if we if we utilize that technique. Do we? Yeah, it's just going to be more pricey. So we can utilize other techniques. Again, it's just the amount of money that it's actually going to cost us. Right. So I want you to be aware of that. You don't need to know all those other techniques. Leave it to NASA to figure those things. I just want you to be aware that we can usually always get a date on on an object. But I did want you to know how radioactive carbon and potassium argon actually works. Okay, so that's the end of geological and paleontological sequences. And really, that's the very end of module one. Um, and all the material that we're gonna, we have studied that'll end up in culminating on a quiz. Okay, so um, thank you for attending module one, and I'll see you guys in module two.